much background. Okay, this is March 13th, 2012, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. June and Ken Hunter are interviewing Horace Perryman, Jr., who's better known as Doc. He served in the United States Army from April 1963 through April 1966. What is your full name and when and where were you born? Full name is Horace Rupert Perryman, Jr. I was born in Gloversville, New York in July of 1943. And what did you do before you entered the service? I um, worked at both Ellis Hospital, St. Clair's Hospital, and also the Saratoga Racetrack. Okay, and uh, why did you choose to enter the Army? Uh, on a body system. A friend of mine, uh, we were very close in high school at Lenton High when we graduated in 61. We uh, got similar jobs and we decided to similarly join the, the, the service at the same time back in 63. And uh, then where did you go for your basic training? Basic training was in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, the, the battalion and the signal and the company, I can't remember, but I do remember my first sergeant, his name was Dun Dunlap, and he made me a assistant, um, first, first uh, assistant sergeant or something like that. I, bl I believe it was the... Uh, uh, platoon, platoon sorry. sergeant. Yeah, that's right. He made me assistant the first day I got there, so I was good to go. Um, they kind of uh, put away some of the things that a lot of the guys had to do. I was privy to being on his side more than I was on their side, but that didn't bother me. I was still, you know, back at, back then we had wooden shacks. We didn't have what these guys had with the porcelain and all of the bricks and everything. Everything was wood and the bottom of the uh, the, the uh, barracks were see-through. You could see the ground through them. And mm. It was a little chilly at times, but we made it through. From Fort Dix, New Jersey, after basic training, I was sent to advanced training in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, or actually uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Uh, back in 1963 for signal work. I was a telephone cable splicer, a pole climber, a um, little bit of everything. I, I worked on a lot, of that, uh, a lot of that stuff. And from that point, after basic training, uh, I was sent to Vietnam. How and, did you arrive over in Vietnam? Um, via airplane, which I'd never been on before. Uh, most exciting adventure of my life. I think I left here when when Albany had the uh, Omaha Airlines back in 1963. From there we went to New York and got on an Eastern Airlines 707. Scared me to death. Biggest plane I've ever seen in my life. But uh, we flew from there to, I believe it was Atlanta, and from Atlanta we flew to um, San Francisco where we caught a Piedmont Air Airlines, and that was like another prop job, uh, to go to Vietnam. And uh, the transition from the Mohawk to this really luxury uh, jetliner uh, Eastern had to the Piedmont was kind of scary, but uh, we made it through. Left San Francisco, it was about 58 degrees, got to Vietnam, and it was about 100 and some change. Um, and we got there just around the 16th or 17th of November, 1963. Did you arrive at the Tonsonut Airport at yes, Saigon? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, in fact, our company was located just outside of Tonsonut at the 232nd Signal Company, 39th Signal Battalion. And I spent uh, just about the whole year right there at the, uh, at the uh, Signal Company, right outside of Tonsonut. I, Exciting place to be because everybody and anybody that came to Vietnam came through Tonsonut Air Force Base and uh, we, we had a chance to see just the generals and the presidents and a little bit of everybody come through in the year that we were there. I sort of settled in in the, in the signal company and uh, they start sending us out to put up telephone lines from Tonsonut Air Force Base into Saigon. And once we got to Saigon, uh, General William Westmoreland, I'll never forget him, back in um, 
about December or January of two, uh, 1964, came to Vietnam to set up shop, and I set up his communications for him. And that probably was one of the more exciting things, other than the fact when I first got there, it was the um, uh, regime of uh, President uh, Dem and Madame Nu who were having the coup at that time. And the people in Vietnam were uh, not so happy that they were having to go, but uh, I, I was put behind a, a machine gun when I first got there. Didn't know how to fire it, but I, I was in a foxhole. I can ne I'll always remember that. It was dark, and it was like uh, probably really the scariest part of my life because I couldn't fire. If somebody was coming, I was in deep trouble because I couldn't fire. This was an M60 machine gun they put me behind. But we made it through that part, and of course the president was killed, and Madame New left the country, and we uh, continued to be, you know, just a support group. At that time, there was only about 25,000 troops there. At that time, um, by the time I got ready to leave in in in, in uh, 1964, uh, it was probably 100,000. And they was blowing up everything about that around that time. So I was fortunate. I got out of there very, very uh, Now, why very didn't you uh, get any training on a machine gun? You didn't get it in base. I was either. in infantry. I was signal. Yeah. They didn't give you signal. People oh. didn't get training on, on an M60 machine gun. We had the, uh, we had the M14, and uh, the M15 was about ready to come in at that time. And, of course, we, we took marksmanship and... You know the rifle mm -hmm. stuff and all of that, but I didn't. Knew, I knew nothing about a machine gun, <laughs> nothing at all. But there I sat for about three days out there, and we hadn't had a chance to put our clothes up yet. It was mm -hmm. just one of those things. And then, about six days later, President Kennedy got killed, mm -hmm. and we were like on full alert, and the place like stopped for at least three days. I knew about Kennedy after he had already died. And uh, they made the announcement on Armed Forces, uh, you know, Stars and Stripes newspaper. That's what it was called back in, that, in those days, and I think they still have it. Um, but we had Armed Forces radio also, mm -hmm. and we heard it on there. And that was kind of sad. That was kind of sad that we weren't home for that. But uh, I, I kind of enjoyed uh, enjoyed my stay. We had somebody to uh, take care of our clothes and clean up after us. We weren't messy people because, you know, the military is not going to let you get so messy. And uh, then they expect you to have a full inspection set up. Your bed's got to be just a certain way and your clothes and your shoes have to be a certain way. And I thought that that part of it was really good for me because I had that kind of discipline when I was home. And uh, it sort of gave me a, a better scope of what I had to do uh, as a grown young man versus, you know, a little teenager that didn't know a heck of a lot, but, you know, we at least knew that we, where we were. I think one of the scariest parts of that whole part of the late 63 and 64, my mother was dying, and uh, she had had cancer of the pancreas, and I knew that I wanted to get back home as soon as possible, but I knew that she wasn't sick enough to keep me here on the state side, so I had to go. Now, that's what happened. You know, we went through it, and she hung in there until I got back home and uh, passed away about a year later. But uh, she, she, was, she was good about that. I, one thing I'll never, never, ever forget, mm -hmm. she waited for me to come back home. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a good. I go part. back in time um, at the when president when President uh, Jim died. How did the population react? What was the situation like? Um, <coughs> was there complete chaos? You know, I don't think so. Where I was, the the deal was that the South Vietnamese people were sort of away from they were almost like South Korea and North Korea. They were sort of away from the North Vietnamese. And there was the aggression into Saigon was not happening at that point. So I didn't really see a lot of clashes between the people. Uh, we were there more as a support for the people in Saigon, 
you know, to set up their military operations if, if necessary. But we um, weren't set there to foresee a battle such as it turned out to be. We weren't, that's not why we were there. We were just supporting the people that were there. Um, my mother was the only one that knew anything about it. I didn't know anything. Vietnam, what's that? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was an adventure. It was an adventure. One that I'll, I'll never forget. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, the way the people lived was of interest to you. Tell us about how they lived the compared way, with here. <laughs> the way that those folks ate food versus the way we were used to eating is like night and day. I mean, there was nothing for them to take garbage and put it into, like, into the ground and cover it up and maybe go back a month or so later and then eat that same garbage. They call it Nook Mom, I believe it was. And uh, they used to take this stuff and they'd put it into a container and they'd feed one another with this Nook Mom. In fact, some of the guys brought some of it home. They kind of liked it, I guess. And it wasn't looking too cool to me. I tell you, one of the, one of the downers were they had bats that made today's bats over here in the United States look like little they were big they were very big and then they had rats that were bigger than the, than the bats and um I, I i don't know i just i i had a tough time keeping track of you know where and where i was because um every step was how, how do i put it every step was an adventure uh when we did guard duty and when we did uh, clean up around you're always running into bugs you're not used to seeing well, tell big about old, that because uh, a lot of us in the United States yeah well know. big old bugs and, and little bitty snakes they didn't have big snakes they had little bitty snakes and there was uh, a few uh, snakes that were I don't know what they called them they were little green snakes about this long and they say if they ever bit you they wipe you out in about 10 seconds and I had one in my boot one night I never forget it I was getting ready to put my boot on and that snake was down in there and I jumped up and <laughs> I said, oh no, this is not working. But other than that, you know, I mean, the bats were, were something to deal with. They only came out at night, but they they were something to deal with. The cats you saw all the time and um, the rats, uh, the rats were big. They, they were humongous. They were bigger than some of the cats that were walking around. Um, but other than that, you know, the bugs, I can't define them. It's been so long, been so long, mm -hmm. you know. I'm sure the guys had spent their their time in this in the jungle. See, as a support unit, we had fortunately the um, conveniences of a lot of stateside troops would have. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the bunks. We didn't sleep outside, and mm -hmm. we we were covered. Of course, we we had uh, mosquito nets around our, our beds, which was a must because mosquitoes were deep. They were heavy, 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 heavy. Um, never, you know, I mean, if you don't have a, a mosquito net, you can guarantee they're going to bite you. And, you know, you can't go to sleep without having a mosquito net around you. Um, but other than that, I'm trying, I'm trying to reach back a little bit and, and go over... Um, some of the time I spent in Saigon, which I thought was most interesting, I had a chance to go to a couple of uh, uh, weddings in Saigon um, and, and uh, taste some of the cultural foods that they had. Tell us about those weddings, uh, what you can remember. What I can remember is a dish that included abalone. It is a white looking fish like thing, um, kind of thick looked more like dough that they had thrown on the table on a plate and they expected you to eat it. Um, a lot of raw fish, a lot of raw fish, uh, a lot of bugs. The people ate bugs over there. They had a whole bunch of bugs. And it was something that you had to, <laughs> it, it, it is something that you had to um, get acquire used to acquire taste, taste for. And it was just no way I was going to acquire a taste. And then, you know, what's funny about it is that the military made a deal with somebody that they would feed us horse meat instead of calf, uh, cattle. And we had to get used to eating horse meat. 
And, you know, when they said we were going to have steaks for dinner, we knew it was horse meat steaks for dinner and not regular cow steaks. But Was there a difference in taste between um, the two? Well, you get used to it. You know, after I, after I uh, left there and had a real steak here, there was a difference. But, you know, you get used to it because it was on the menu every week. Was it uh, tougher than no, most cows? No, it was very tasty. Was very it very tasty. salty yeah. or anything? A little bit salty, yeah, a little bit salty. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, I think the food that they served over there caused a lot of men to have high blood pressure because it was like loaded down with salt, you know. But then again, we had milk, which I can't stand today, but I drank more milk than I ever thought I would. And we had mashed potatoes, which I cannot eat anymore. You know, it was just like I knew that they were artificial. You know, a lot of artificial foods. You just, but mm. like I said, it's uh, we we had a club there that we used to get together and play pinochle 24/7, especially on the weekends. And it was just like being home after you get to know the guys and everything. Mm. It was fun. It was fun. They showed us a movie every night. Uh, we had at least one or two movies that we could see. Every night they they had this big screened in place where we used to go down and just watch movies every every single night, not Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. and that was kind of nice too. How safe was it to go into town? For me, I used to walk into town. I was three miles from Saigon, and um, I thought it was pretty cool. They had they had taxis that used to come and and take the guys back and forth, but a lot of us used to walk. It wasn't that far for us. I thought when I was there it was very safe. I thought so. It was only until I got ready to leave as they start blowing up uh, bars and s restaurants and stuff where the Americans used to congregate. Uh, they did have something that I didn't care for and that's one thing that I think might be interesting to your to your viewers. The um, segregation was quite heavy. Uh, I had to learn to know where to go and when to go because it was similar to being in uh, Georgia. It was no different. When I went to Georgia, being from the north, I had to learn that I couldn't go everywhere I wanted to go um, because they had for blacks only and for whites only faucets and movie theaters and, and restaurants. Well, it was similar to that in Vietnam, only in smaller proportions. And they didn't break down the bathrooms and everything like that, but they had a section of Saigon that was for blacks only. And uh, it, they just broke it down like that. It was, it was, I'm trying to think of the name of it and I can't think of it. I knew there was a, there was a bridge that separated that part of Saigon from the, uh, from the, from the black part. So, Saigon would not have had that division if the United States wasn't over there? I doubt it very seriously. I Just doubt it very seriously. Just when we coming. all started coming over there, they start making those separatism type things. To tell you the truth, the white soldiers that were there at that point were just as receptive to us as we were to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, we didn't have the guys in the military didn't have that separatism mm -hmm. but they would not allow us to go into certain parts of Saigon where they weren't allowed to come into other parts of Saigon so it was it was still separate. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you what happened after I left because um, I don't know and I didn't keep up with all of the guys that were in, in my uh, platoon or in my company. Did you have any contact with the South Vietnamese forces? No. No. Uh, yes or no? Why, why am I saying no? Uh, I did work with a few of them, but, you know, the language barrier sort of restricted me from knowing too much about them. I talked to the lady you see in that picture a lot more than I talked to the troops from South Vietnam, because she kept me on her straight and narrow. She told me where to go and what not to do. and. Uh, but the Vietnamese were all over the place. They were, they were like that. That, that was their country. We were just, right. we were the visitors, you know. You didn't get daily briefings on what areas to avoid. No. Reason no. I say no. that because I was in a military advisory group over there before you came. Okay. And we used to get daily briefings on where to stay out, what was going to go on, 
that there was going to be political activity. Yeah. The... No, I didn't. I don't remember any of that. Uh, that that part of uh, getting together. I can see my country and my company commander. This plane is. I'm looking at you, and I can't think of his name. I had a picture of him. my wife's got the picture upstairs. Um, and he was um, he was he was straight. He was a good person. And we we didn't have too much trouble. We didn't have too much trouble. I I probably received more problems over Seaside than I did over there. You know, even though it was separate in certain parts of Saigon. Uh, when I left there and, and went back to Fort Dix and then was TDY to uh, Watertown, then it started, and then we started having problems. I I never thought that Watertown would be like that, but it was. You know, New York too. Hmm. It was terrible. Yeah, I don't know if you remember it. Used to you be dead. I hated it. <laughs> what was the worst duty in the world? The camp it used to be Camp Drum before it became yes, Fort Yes, well, it Fort was. Drum. It was Camp Drum. You know. So tell us then how it was like when you did come back. Then how you said you were treated. Um, on the return trip back, we didn't go back to Georgia. We went back to Fort Dix. Fort Dix, I was I was made a specialist fourth class, which was E four at that point. And um, I was still into doing the signal work, so they sent a bunch of us TDY up to Camp Drum for six months. And uh, that happened from probably April of 1964 through November of 64. Oh, you left before the big snowstorm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we were out of there before, uh, before it started snowing real hard, yeah. And then, the, the, well, we'll get into that later. Um, I found that was a, a harder duty than it was in Vietnam, because you couldn't get away when you wanted to, at all. There was just no place to go. Had one bus coming to Schenectady, and you had to go from there to Syracuse, from Syracuse to Utica, from Utica to Schenectady, and you're lucky it took you six, seven hours to go a couple, a hundred and something miles. You know, it was awful. Did you find in Vietnam the people were riding bicycles for most of their transportation? Yeah, or? those in the, um, I'm trying to think what they call those things. Cyclos. Excuse, excuse me? Cyclos. Oh, yeah, cyclos. There you go. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what they rode around with. You know, that's what I used to ride around in. I never, I never bothered bicycle stuff. Yeah. And have a lot of motor scooters when you were there? Yeah, yeah, a lot of them. A lot of little small Volkswagen Beetle type cabs. I don't know what they called them, but they, there was a bunch of them. Yeah. And uh, were the streets busy <coughs> 24 hours a day? Uh, um, yes, know, yes, right? yeah, I would say so. We found that the, the majority of the um, people came out between 9 o'clock in the morning until about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then it sort of calmed down oh. after that. Um, my wife will get that. Okay. Um, it was, it was, it was pretty cool during the during the evening hours. You know, we were allowed to go in after after our regular duties. We were allowed to go into Saigon and uh, dressed in civil, civilian clothes. Didn't have to do military. No guns. No nothing. And uh, I can. And you felt safe. Yeah, I did very much so. Very now much you so. had the uh, woman who helped you clean up your barracks and so on. How? We hear sometimes they'd hire people like that to infiltrate to, the to infiltrate the troops. It. Yeah, I mean, how did you f find her and how they work? And well, in the company, they, each know. each uh, hooch is assigned a mama sign, and uh, there was another young man who used to come and do our boots. Uh, she used to just clean the hooches up, but uh, this other guy would do our boots and stuff. You know, we paid him practically nothing to do work to, you know, we didn't feel like doing it at the time, and as long as it was available to us, and we did it that way. But uh, most of our daily chores and stuff were done by her. You know, she took care of just about everything. And, you know, we, mm -hmm. it had to be a, 
a degree of trust between the troops and, and the Mama Sign. Who, and normally we had about eight guys in a hooch, uh, which was on screen, mm -hmm. no no walls or nothing. It was all screen and screen and metal, so you knew when it was raining, and you could look down on the, on the ground. But uh, you know, you heard it on the roof. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Now, did you have any trouble uh, with the telephone system lines being destroyed, and did you have to go back and keep repairing them? Uh, Okay, back then we used plastic cable. There was no metal cable, and that's because of the uh, the, the insects that were out there. They used to eat up uh, coaxial cable from the inside out, uh, but the plastic cable sort of let us know that whether or not we were being infested with with bugs and stuff. Um, had very little trouble putting up new lines and stuff. Um, when we started from Tatsunut to run the line all the way into Saigon, um, we had a crew of about 10, 15 guys and that's all we did all day is just put up cell phone lines and then at certain junctures we would splice in the phones that were necessary for some of the some of the officers going in because as you went down um, into Saigon the officers lived on some of those roads so, no, it was, uh, it was interesting. Do they provide special protective, uh, no. for the, for no. the officers leaving, living? If they did, they didn't let us know about it. They didn't, they didn't provide anything for us. They didn't have a guy with a rifle around us or whatever. No. Uh, I think we were sort of thrown out there to do what they, what they needed to do and get ready for the next unit to come through. But, um. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution was was uh, put down in, in the middle of '64, and we got an order saying that we were going to stay in Vietnam for another month extra. So when my tour should have ended in October, they pushed it into November, and I was not a happy camper, but you know everybody was doing the same thing. And the, we used to go to a coffee shop and get ready to go to work every morning and. It was about six months after we left that coffee shop that they blew it up. The Viet Cong blew it up. Uh, so I wasn't uh, in danger other than that. You know, we didn't have any problems. So did, who, uh, I assume they had people cooking for you people on the base. No, no. The cooking part uh, all was all done by the military. Right. That, that was all done by we had We had our own uh, uh, kitchen and carrying on and, you know, mess hall and everything. Mm. So, you know, I mean, everything was all Americanized. You pretty well. Yeah, the only thing wasn't Americanized was their beer and their cigarettes. Well, they had American cigarettes and stuff. And that was one bad habit I picked up over there. But you're talking about if you wanted to drink, I tell you, whew, you was, I mean, a dollar a bottle of cognac and stuff like that. Beer was like 10 cents. It was like crazy. Guys used to get wiped every day. <laughs> they, they used to get wiped every day. Nobody wanted to be there. I can remember Christmas of two of, of uh, 1963 being 102 degrees on mm -hmm. Christmas Day, mm -hmm. and we stayed inside the um, the uh, what do they call these things? They're like a canteen or whatever, where they used to sell things to to the guys, and uh, we used to stay inside there just to get out of the heat because it was mm -hmm. so hot and there was no air conditioning in the hooches. So. Yeah, the big fans. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, were there a lot of power disruptions? No. And we didn't no. when we were there. They were, you never could tell. Them. And yeah. the water was always uh, going on and off, on yeah. and off. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't find that kind of problem at all, and I can't imagine. Um, you know, I can't imagine how much worse it could have got. I thought my, my conditions were bad. But, you know, the other guys were going through even worse. You know, the more stories I heard about guys that had been there um, and what they did when they got there, I didn't have to go through all of that. I was lucky. I was yeah, very lucky. Were. I was very lucky. Now, did you ever get to go tour the country or go around a I bit? left on a TDY to Ding Tao. I went to Thailand, only on a TDY, well, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's 
like a rest of vacation or whatatever they sent R&R. to him. Other than R and R, yeah, that, there you go. Those words are when you say them now that they come mm-hmm. out, yeah. But uh, so, what you see in these other places uh, was the did they have good roads or were they all dirt roads when you were there? Or? Okay, now the road from Tonsonwood Air Force Base down to uh, Saigon was fine. I mean, it wasn't. Uh, it was paved. It mm-hmm. was paved. Um, when we got up to Vung Tau and got off the Caribou Plain, which you could see out of the back end, and that was kind of scary. Uh, I had never been in a plane that you could look out and see the see the the grass and 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 bushes and, and stuff. And I said, "Oh, this ain't working." I, I made sure I stayed away from the edge, but uh, but that's the way we flew up there, and we were just on a a regular R and R mission, but. Uh, no problems. And that's no, no. Were there any traveling uh, entertainers like from USO when you were there? You know what? None that I can remember. I really don't remember. No, nobody that struck a hard string. You know, back then I was um, I, I was still in love with music. I loved music, and I was trying to keep up. But Stars and Stripes only gave you but so much information. And the rest had to come from your family. And my, my mother used to send me Ebony and, and Jet Magazine all the time. But, um, it wasn't until I got back and, that I found out that uh, a lot of things had happened while I was gone that I didn't realize. But that was good. I caught up quick. You did? Yeah, I did. Okay. I caught up quick. You mentioned uh, that while you were over <coughs> there, President Kennedy was assassinated. What was the general mood like amongst the troops? Total disbelief. We we went through two events that happened over there while we were there. One was the the um, Muhammad Ali thing. Uh, he fought while we were over there. I, I believe it was the Joe Frazier fight or mm-hmm. whatever. One of one of the two. One of the big fights he had. And uh, and and on the twenty second of November, nineteen sixty three. That was like when the place stopped for a while. You know, it was. It was the move was I, I don't know how it was here, but it was like solemn, very solemn. Mm-hmm. Uh, we I, were glued to television sets here. I don't know. How we it was didn't here. have any TVs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, no TVs that I know of. <laughs> if they were there, we had a radio. Yeah, we had a radio, but, uh, and no TVs that I know. Did you find or know if any of the people who were natives of Vietnam even had televisions and radios? I wouldn't go on the search. No. But like me. No. I didn't make them kind of friends. Them high for little friends. Well, now. I meant to go <laughs> drive them down. No. Well, I wouldn't go on and knock on nobody's door. <laughs> now, they're playing very poor. General economy. Westmoreland had a television. Yeah, when he got there, boy, like the time stopped. The troop, you're talking about a man with clout. Everybody stopped when he showed up. He was like the next next one in line for the presidency, almost as seen that way. But uh, he was only a, a three-star general when he first got there. Well, when he, by the time he got ready to leave, they made him a four-star general, and then they made him general of the army. I said, oh, you go, guy. But he was pretty cool. I liked mm-hmm. him. He was yeah. a nice man. Mm-hmm. Now, we have gone through the Vietnam thing. We have gone through, you know, what I did when I got back. My final parts of the of the uh, of the service were from Watertown back to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and I worked for New Jersey Bell down there uh, with the telephone guys down there and set up uh, communications for Fort Dix and um, uh, trying to think of the Trenton. We went went as far south as Trenton, and we worked right outside of uh, Fort Dix, and I can't think of the name of it. This little hick town that they had down there. Anyway, we we did uh, communications for. Excuse me. Savage. (laughs) It was weird, but uh, it was fun too. At the same time, and then I was released in um, April of two thousand. 1996, 1966, that's what it was, 96. So then, uh, how'd you get home, Jeff? On a bus, train? longest <laughs> bus of my life. It took from there to 
Port Authority, and I waited in Port Authority like it seemed like for about four or five days, yeah. but it was only a few hours, and then we finally got home. Finally Did you have to pay your own way back? Did they provide you with the funds to go home? They gave us a ticket. They gave us a ticket to come home. Uh, it was so strange. Back in those days, I was only making $35 a, a, a month. These guys are making, well, I, I don't even know. My son was making somewhere in the thousands somewhere. You mentioned your son uh, retired from the he military. He retired from uh, the military in uh, 2000, I mean, yeah, 2009. That's when he got out. Uh, he went into the softer service, the Navy. He went into the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he kind of liked it. He kind of liked it. He was, uh, he left here um, from St. Lawrence University. And that's what I was going to tell you. He, I used to have to go to St. Lawrence University to see him play basketball. And, of course, St. Lawrence is right next to Watertown. So that's that was one of those things that came after the fact. But, you know, he played for Lenton High School. And, uh, mm -hmm. also. Was the GI Bill offered to you when you were yes, discharged? Yes, and I utilized it to purchase this house. And I've been in this house ever mm -hmm. since, and I don't see any reason why I should leave it. You know, you know right. new house is a new house, but old houses last a lot longer, I'm telling you. I mean, they're a lot safer, if you ask me. I did have it rewired and stuff, but other than that, this is a place to be. Now, did you think of, of extending your service uh, in in reserves or so after you were officially well, discharged. As I mentioned to you earlier, I was in the uh, the National Guards, the Air Force National Guards. I, I got into that shortly after I got out of the service, um, and uh, didn't like it. So I said, no, I can't do this, and just quit. Just up and quit. They, they gave me an honorable discharge, and, and I haven't looked back since. Mm -hmm. And since that time, what was the, your Occupation uh, then? Well, that that varies. I left. I left the military. Went to as old, most people do when they get back in Schenectady. Back in the '60s, we went to GE and uh, worked for Building 269, putting metal tubes together for generators. Hated it. In any case, I uh, at the same time started going to school, the Career Academy School of Broadcasting. And after I finished that, I uh, decided that I would try to go to work for WGY. And they told me that that wasn't that wasn't the way. We can't do this. And, you know, you need some experience. So I left there and went to work for WSNY. Um, and suing. And shortly after that, I, I got a job at WABY. And shortly after that, I got a job at WQBK. So I worked for three different radio stations in a matter of one week. I was at three different stations. Um, I had a full-time job at WSNY. I had a part-time job at WQBK and a part-time job at WX, uh, WQBK. And then um, about three, three years later, I decided to give WGY another shot. And uh, I wasn't hired to work at WGY, but I was hired to work for WRGB. And that was in 1973, so it took me that long to to get into broadcasting. But in '73, I went to work for WRGB and start working for WGY in 1974, and that uh, that was 20 years, 20 years at WRGB, and uh, well, 30 years at WRGB and 20 years at WGY. So. I've seen quite a change in the broadcasting business. Uh, oh, it was like night and day. We had uh, we were doing everything by hand when I first got to uh, WRGB, and my job as a traffic person was to put the log together for traffic and put the numbers down of the films and of the tapes that were going to run for that next day and bring out a log so that master control could follow it. And we went from doing it by hand to doing it by computer to doing it by a service to doing it by a service connected to other stations and you know and now that same service that we were working with and uh, they moved it to Buffalo so we have no local traffic department at WRGB anymore so yeah I've seen a lot of different changes up there I got there just as uh, Earl Putney was leaving, 
I got there just as Bill Edwardson was on his downward track. I got there just as uh, Steve Fitz was, was still working. Uh, Harry Downey and I were good friends. Um, Don Weeks and I were good. In fact, I did Don Weeks' daughter's weddings, mm -hmm. two of them. Um, so, you know, I've gone through a lot of different... Uh, Liz mm -hmm. Bishop was, wasn't even at the station when I got there. Mm -hmm. And she's, of course, you know, has been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's got mm -hmm. almost 40 years up there. Better. Hmm. Yeah, two more years she'll have 40 years. So she's lucky she was able to hang out. Yes, a lot of yeah. people are she's a gorgeous lady, go very gorgeous lady, gorgeous <laughs> lady. And she's taking care of herself and she okay. looks good. And I can see why they would want her to, to work there. Now, now the United States is involved in the activities overseas. Would that change uh, have changed your opinion of going into the service if? This you you were a young man at this time, compared to what it was at the Vietnam. Would you feel uh, compelled to go in? If I was a young man at this time in my life, and mind you, didn't know what I know today, I probably would have joined. I probably mm -hmm. would have joined. I, um, you know, when you're when you're coming out of high school and you don't see any prospect for you to go to college, um, I think for the young people who who are um, who are just sitting around not doing anything, it's the best thing for them. And I was one of those young people that I wasn't doing a lot. Of, I was working at I was working, but I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And uh, this was an opportunity for me to better myself, as, as my friend and I say, I just talked to him the other day. Um, and that's what we did. That's what we did, decided to join the military. Now, at that point, I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I'd never heard of it. Mm -hmm. It's only until I called my mother and said, Mom, we're going to Vietnam, that she jumped through the phone and said, start crying again. I, and I said, what's wrong with you? She says, you're not going over there. I said, yes, I am. I did go to put me out of plane, and I got to go. And, you know, I, she was sick. She was sick, and I, I really didn't want to go, but it, she wasn't that sick that I couldn't go. And uh, my brother, the one that's in the hospital right now, is, uh, he got married. And they weren't taking married guys at that time. Mm -hmm. So he, he, made it, he made it through. He got married in 65. Him and his wife will be celebrating almost 40, 45 years, 46 years, I guess, yeah, coming up. So... Uh... Really, it was probably good for you then that you had the experience, or do you think For that? my own sanity and the fact that I needed the uh, structure mm -hmm. that the military provides, it was good for me. Mm -hmm. It was good for me. It, it, uh, it made me um, Grow a more structured person. I mean, I get up and... Maybe it, maybe it's too much of a of a structured person because I, I I put my kids through hell at times, um, and Daddy said get up. I mean get up. I don't mean no half step. And, you know, and I was one of them who used to pull them out of bed if they weren't ready. Of course, you can't do that anymore. But you know, mm -hmm. back in the day, I, it was no, you know, don't touch your kids and that kind of stuff. So they knew I wasn't playing. But I was a structured guy for a while. And mm -hmm. I've sort of calmed down a lot. I've awful yeah. lot. Yeah. yeah. So you haven't been involved in any military organizations or anything? I had, you know, it's funny. I had looked into doing the VFW thing. I uh, went up to one of the local chapters and, and asked about it. Um, they didn't seem too interested in me coming in, so I didn't bother. But I knew a young man by the name of uh, Kane. Mr. Kane, Howard Kane, I believe his name, tall, nice looking man who was the head of the VFW for many, many years in this area. Um, and he often asked me, he said, why don't you get in the VFW? Him and Mr. Boyd. Mr. Boyd was one of those uh, one of those guys who was in the VFW too. But in any case, I never joined him. And uh, I don't know. I don't know Just what I... Just wasn't your thing. Yeah. I did join the Masons. Yeah, and that's, that's been part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I joined because my father was a Mason. Yeah. And the, the history. Well, this has been a, v a very interesting visit here in Schenectady, New York. 
And uh, we want to thank you for your service. Oh, you're more than welcome. You know, I don't look at it as a whole bunch of service anymore. <laughs>